Welcome to No Longer Conformed. I'm Eric Garthy, and we are studying the book of Ephesians, The Mystery Revealed. In this session, we'll be looking at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 to 24, Empowered for Battle. Last session, we considered the armor of God. Still in the imagery of warfare, there is an unsung but crucial element to consider. On the battlefield, what do you do when you run out of bullets? How do you take care of a flat tire? Where do you go when the fuel tank is low? Where does food come from? Military supply lines, the resources for the war. You need them nearby. You need open communication with them. Spiritual warfare requires spiritual resources. Prayer is the communication line. Spiritual armor is taken up and worn by prayer. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Instructions on this powerful supply line. Pray always, publicly, privately, solemnly, suddenly. And then pray always, but pray always. Confession of sins. Requests for mercy expressions of thanksgiving, prayer of intercession, spiritual conflict demands comprehensive prayer. Spiritual conflict demands prayer which is continual. It calls for constant alertness. In the Spirit means guided by the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8 verse 26 Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Satan cannot defend against the prayers of the saints unless he can get them to stop praying. Prayer is our most deadly weapon when used along with the Word of God. Look at verses 19 and 20 of Ephesians 6. And for me, pray for all the saints, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Christian leaders need prayer. Why? In a war, the leaders get targeted because if you can bring down a leader, it means confusion and regrouping. The devil always attempts to bring down the pastor. Paul asked for prayer that he would have more power. Why should Christians pray for their leaders? Well, let me give you three reasons from our text. First, pray that leaders receive God's message with clarity. Verse 19, the first part of it. And for me, that utterance may be given to me. Paul was praying, was saying, pray that whenever I preach, I will have the right words to deliver the message. Pray that leaders will be diligent in Bible study and prayer. Second, pray that leaders will speak God's message with boldness. The second part of verse 19 and 20, that I may open my mouth boldly, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul revealed that though he knew he was to be bold, sometimes it was difficult. And sometimes he failed. It's easy to be swayed by worldly thinking, the rejection of people, 
or how the word will offend some. Pray that leaders will not be intimidated by human reasoning. And then third, pray that leaders will explain God's message with understanding. The third part of verse 19, that I may make known the mystery of the gospel. Paul wanted to explain the gospel in such a way that hearers would understand and apply the truth to their lives. You see, it, it's easy to read scriptures to someone. It's another whole matter to show them what to do with it. Pray that leaders will explain how to apply biblical truth. War, warfare always has the objective of victory. Don't give up in the middle of the battle. Make sure you remain connected to the supply line, linked to God's throne of grace through prayer. Hebrews 4, verse 16. <clears throat> Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Our walk with God must be consistent with our profession of faith. Without consistency, you cannot be an effective servant. If you talk the talk, you gotta walk the walk. Paul's closing words of greeting at the end of the letter, rather than at the beginning, which was common, are personal notes, which is, seems to always be the case. Even in a few personal comments, we can learn much. From this session's closing text, Galate, uh, Ephesians 6, verses 21 to 24. Three qualities of an effective Christian servant. First, an effective servant is a faithful minister, verse 21. But that you also may know my affairs and how I am doing. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord will make things known to you. Servants of Christ are more concerned for the good of others than their own welfare. Paul wanted his readers to know his circumstances. Why? So that they would not worry about him. It upset him to know that they were concerned. Note, Paul, note that Paul was in prison in Rome. Two goals could be accomplished by a visit. They could, be more, they could more effectively pray for Paul and he could better learn how they're doing. So the apostle sent Tychicus, faithful minister. Faithful speaks of commitment to ministry. It shows a heart of ministry and humility. May all Christians be described as Tychicus is here by Paul. Second, an effective servant is a compassionate mediator. Verse 22 whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know my, our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. The apostle was concerned for the Ephesians, but it was Tychicus who administered to them for Paul as his mediator. Sometimes we must serve in place of another, expressing ministry. Paul couldn't go himself because he was in jail. And then third, an effective servant is a sincere messenger. Verses 23 and 24. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Paul, God wants sincerity in his servants. Paul offered a tripart blessing as he concluded. Peace, love, faith. Peace with God, with, with your own conscience and with each other as Christians. Love, spiritually motivated, and faith, the gift of God. These are to continue and to increase. Paul's blessing here is specifically directed. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Listen, this message is to the church. It's not to the world. It's not to unbelievers. It's to the church. 
Paul is speaking to fellow Christians. All Christians are messengers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, sharing the good news. Because we all come the same way. We want to reach out to those who aren't part of the church. We want to share what we've gained because Paul tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life by Christ Jesus. We deserve what we get. As sinners, we have earned an eternity being punished in hell apart from God. But you know, God loves us. And so it says that the free gift of God is eternal life by Christ Jesus. God doesn't want us in hell for eternity. He wants us enjoying eternal life. And he did it through Jesus Christ. And what was his motivation? Well, John 3.16 tells us, for God so loved the world. That was his motivation, love. That he gave his only begotten son. He sent Jesus. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's because of God's love. It's because he sent Jesus that we can have eternal life rather than eternal death if we believe in him, if we put our trust in him. And God demonstrated that love by sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross in our place to take the punishment that we deserve Romans 5, 8, God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus died in our place so that we wouldn't have to go to hell. He took the punishment we deserved. Of course, he didn't go to hell because Jesus never sinned. He did not deserve to go to hell. But he took the death penalty for us so that we wouldn't have to suffer an eternity apart from God because of our sin. And all we need to do is, as we believe that Jesus died for us with that conviction and that God raised him from the dead and can give us victory over death as he rose from the dead himself, if we confess that, it says we'll be saved. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. For with our mouth confession is made, and with the heart we believe unto righteousness. Romans 10, 9 and 10. And then we just need to reach out and ask God. We just need to trust him and believe that he died for us and ask him. Ask him to forgive us. Romans 10, 13. And whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you know Jesus? Is he your personal Savior and Lord? Think about that. And you do business with God. If need be, you profess your sin and your belief in Jesus and ask him to forgive you. Put your trust in him. You have a great day.